All right, you can get your little and David, waiver. if you've got the ability to let me uh, share my screen. Absolutely, Tom. I guess I'll let you be a, a co-host here today. I promise, I promise to host responsibly. Okay, okay. So as long, long as it's part of the plan. Then, yeah, so uh, it's good, good to see some of you know Tom. Uh, uh, hopefully a good number of you don't yet because you're in for a treat. And, and Tom is someone who was just uh, a, a just uh, you know, way up there in that client hall of fame when I was working at 360i and 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 very actively working on trying to figure out what the agency's role in mobile marketing should be uh, and even publishing a mobile marketing playbook like like Tom was already yeah you know, we were like like how do we even talk about this stuff and Tom was well ahead of doing it right now probably had like it probably had to scrub some references to what he was doing at coca-cola at the time um so that it wasn't just the coca-cola mobile marketing playbook since uh, I, th I think for many he wrote it and in his, his various roles he's he's been a very uh he's been very generous at sharing what he uh, what he knows and learns and so when when i was hearing about what he was doing i was like like how can we share this with more of the community and and just uh, get folks uh, up to speed? So it's just such a treat for me personally to have Tom on the line here. Um, uh, I'm sure it will be for a lot of you too. And then uh, yeah, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Tom, and then we'll have some discussion from there. Well, that's very generous, David. I am uh, equally appreciative um, and inspired by your work. Um, I recognize some faces here. Um, if I've shared anything, it's because I listened well and learned from some people on this call. And uh, you know, my hope today is to share some, you know, just share some work that I've been doing over the past couple of years to take what I have learned along the way, package it up, productize it, and, and share as freely as I can. You know, there's a, a part of this that I hope to make a buck out of, but that's not today, right? Today, what I hope to do is share a framework and a model that you might be able to apply within your organization with your clients. I'm not sure what everybody here um, does for a living, um, but I'm trying to make uh, what I've got as actionable as, as possible. So um, with that, let me just make sure that I'm able to progress the slides here. So um, a long time ago, you know, I turned big ships in small spaces. A buddy of mine or boss's boss became a friend, um, saw me toiling away in the mid 90s in front of my computer at UPS, um, getting impatient at the dawn of all this web stuff um, and encouraged me to be patient and, and offered up an analogy that kind of moving UPS was like turning a battleship in the Chattahoochee. And for those who don't know Atlanta, um, the Chattahoochee is not a river built for battleships. It, you know, the idea was, you know, a lot of back and forth, you'll eventually get there, but it's going to take some effort. So I, you know, oh, okay, that is encouraging. That did help me um, find a little patience and just know that was going to take time. And you no, know, it, it just, it opened up a bunch of thoughts in my head about how to get things done. So when I say that I turn big ships in small spaces, a few things come to mind. One, it's your ship. Right. I, I, I'm not in the business of being, you know, I can, I'm comfortable on the bridge, um, but I'm also comfortable on the boiler room, just getting things done. But as a tugboat, I'm, I, I'm a tugboat. Big ships don't turn big ships, tugboats turn big ships. So that's kind of how I see myself in this, in this discussion. And the other thing to keep in mind, what I'm about to share with you, I'm not built for the journey. None of this is going to give you your long term plan. But what I hope it does. It, it, it'll help get you from where you might find yourself now to a you know, place where you're unstuck or you know how to navigate so you can get out of the treacherous waters and, and find some, some you know, easier sailing. Um, so just if you don't know me, um, you know, I've, I've been cracking away at this for a long time. I've had a lucky career, worked for some large companies, UPS, ING, the Coca-Cola company, spent a year as an interim CMO at the, you know, the Technology Association of Georgia, which uh, is the largest such organization of its kind representing companies like 
UPS, Coca-Cola, Delta, you know, Georgia Pacific, you know, Atlanta, Georgia based multinationals and smaller companies. So just seeing a lot of stuff and had an ability to influence on what I'm doing. And what I'm sharing really has been in the back of my mind um, as I've engaged in all of these roles, although admittedly, not all of it has been as well developed as it is now, but that's just the nature of just kind of older and wiser and more and more trips around the sun. So it, it starts, you know, this is really about digital transformation. Generally speaking, we can substitute marketing for the word digital, because a lot of this can be di about digital transformation. In the event your work touches on sustainability, I also know that these themes um, can be can have a positive impact in driving sustainability agendas. Um, that kind of suggests that this is these themes and what I'm about to what I'm going to share with you have applicability applicability beyond digital. Uh, I'm not sure it applies to everything though, but you know that'll be for you to decide. If you've been in the business of digital transformation, either formally, officially signed up for a VP of digital transformation role, got involved in an internal transformation initiative, or you've just been trying to drive, you know, back at UPS, it wasn't digital transformation. You know, and frankly, I'm not even sure if Coca-Cola was digital transformation. Everything was transformative. The web was transformative. Everything you did was transformation. So don't get hung up on the title, but Using that theme or using that, you know, digital transformation as a category, uh, you know, how's that for a headline? From dazzling to departed, why chief digital officers are doomed to fail. Now, if that doesn't catch your attention, I don't know what does. Um, the chief digital officers apparently has replaced the CMO as the shortest tenured executive in the C-suite. Um, almost all digital transformation programs fail to deliver um, their value uh, for a number of reasons, right? So um, people don't believe that they've got the right capabilities. And these last four bullet points, uh, the last four bullet points are, are information that, that I've gathered. Um, they don't believe in internal capabilities. They don't believe that they're getting value from external partners. They don't believe in ROI assessments or they've got some skepticism, some doubts floating around in the back of their mind. Um, and they're, you know, reluctance to embrace new technology. So definitely a lot of uh, cross currents. Um, however, you know, you, you got to do this. We all know, especially this group, you know, nobody on this call doubts um, the value of transformation. Again, whether for the digital transformation or marketing transformation, um, the spend continues to grow. The CAGR is pretty impressive. Um, just a tremendous amount of money being spent. You know, it turns out this little quote from Magellan kind of bridges these two ideas, both the, the danger of it um, and the reasons to do this, right? The sea is dangerous, dangerous and its storms terrible, but these obstacles have never been sufficient reason to remain ashore. And I'm, I'm gonna suggest that if you know David, you're involved in serial marketer, you are um, Magellan-like in your own way. You know, it's hard work, um, but yet you persevere and, and you're prepared to lead your organizations um, in getting there. So what I've done, um, and, and it's, it's, I don't know how much of this is creative, obvious, or so obvious that it's, it's, it's kind of useful, but all of us have only two things that we can manage, and that is money and people. And that may sound, okay, now you can build rocket ships with money and people, you can write software with money and people, you can build stores, um, you know, package delivery, bid, whatever your business is, people and money, not a not a super insightful thing in my opinion. However, organizing those two things once more, right, gets you to everything. All expenditures fall into only one of two categories. There is either, you know, a knowable ROI or no knowable ROI, which of course doesn't mean you shouldn't do it because we can call that um, innovation. Um, and similarly, people come in only one of two buckets. They're either internal and on your payroll or they're not. Again, I don't know everybody here. Um, you may be consultants, you may be client side, um, but those four themes 
is everything. There is no way to do work without internal people, external people, or some combination. And there is no dollar that you can expend um, that doesn't have at least a knowable ROI, by which I mean can be discovered, you may not have the budget or the inclination to go get it, but it's knowable um, or things none of us know what the ROI is. And to me, this kind of creates a nice, um, a nice virtuous cycle because in that realm of unknowable ROI innovations, well, you know, eventually, you know, the future becomes the present and begins to set the stage for internal people and external people and, and the work that they do. So current number one, let's call that um, you know, winning today, you'll see kind of how I interpret that, you know, it's, it's pretty clear from all kinds of research and citations that um, this work is hard and it tends to collapse, you know, McKinsey, a lot of McKinsey citations here, I don't typically do that, but um, they happen to have views that, that, that reflect my experience in this space. You know, misaligned goals, a funny, you know, fuzzy vision, uninspiring ambitions. Boy, there's a lot of work to get not very far, or that doesn't sound super exciting. You know, so I'm, I'm happy kind of where I am. Well, I, I have undertaken to ask a bunch of um, people, you know, survey monkey survey, um, plus some client engagements, proof of concepts. Um, the data that I'm going to show you reflects two of the most recent surveys. So the sample is only about 400 people, but the data reflects what I have learned across um, a previous 800. And the only reason I am not sharing aggregate results from all 1,200 in or, or inputs that I've received is that I've been experimenting a little bit and the language hadn't been consistent survey to survey. So these charts that you're gonna see reflect consistent questions asked of a consistent audience, but the overall data has been affirmed by everything that came before it. So if, if we were to talk about and explore, um, you know, confidence internally, when thinking about digital capabilities and internal people processes and technologies, which statement best describes your opinion of our business, right? So how do you feel about the people you work with? Um, at a surface level, it would look like um, about the same number of respondents feel that competitors, you know, view themselves and their companies as the one to beat in the market, about 18%. However, there are about 15% who think that even the basics are a struggle. So if you're sitting in a chair trying to figure out how to lead the organization, that gap um, presents you know, just one challenge. But when you dig down a little bit deeper, um, you know, within that, if you start taking a look at this by title, only 3% of the C-suite believes that digital is a struggle where almost a third of managers feel like they're floundering, that they really, you know, kind of can't get where they need to go. So if this is your job and you've been hired to drive digital transformation, that simple gap starts telling you where they're going to be some rocks, right? The very first thing I'm going to tell you is, you know, getting everybody super clear on how value is created is critical. Right, a lot of us, um, a lot of us, in my opinion, have over rotated towards, um, you know, this first value creation exchanges, optimizing resource allocation, and in, you know, this is about performance marketing. Everything is about squeezing an extra transaction out of the dollar. Good, great, of course, you want to do that, but that's only one way of creating value. Um, you can also create value by driving engagement. And these words um, are, are selected from a Harvard Business Review article back in November and December of 2020. Happy to share that around if people are interested. Um, engagement is a second way, and then experience is a, is a third way. And you can read the definitions there. And oh, by the way, you don't have to pick just one. You can do all three but those are different people, different processes, different technologies, different vocabulary, and frankly, different objectives. Um, and unless you're really clear about how it is you're 
creating value, you won't know what people are supposed to do or how to build out capabilities, right? To get, to, you know, to close those gaps. So this is a, an insight from a tool that was actually developed um, by some former colleagues of mine at the Coca-Cola company who are now um, academics. Uh, this, this research was started at Georgia Tech, finished up at Emory um, and done in consultation with the Mobile Marketing Association. It's really a diagnostic tool to understand you know, where the capabilities are within an organization if their role is to deliver value against those three dimensions. So what do you need if your value creation is around exchanges, right? Or uh, performance marketing, because they will be different. I mean, this may sound obvious, but getting into the detail and really understanding you know, what it takes and what those people need to look like in the organization um, requires some pretty deep analysis. Um, language that I've used in the past, you know, same input, same output. So David, you are generous, um, very generous in describing, you know, me as, as, you know, maybe having some special insights looking, you know, around the corner and seeing things that, you know, I, was, if I did, it was only because I, I had different inputs. I was in a position where I could see, you know, hear and learn different things. You know, it doesn't come from just, you know, kind of staring at the sky and imagining things. It's just, I learned things. Right. And I assembled them and I put them in, you know, and I started reaching some conclusions. I strongly believe that within an organization, if everybody gets the same inputs that we collectively get, then they are pretty likely to arrive at the same outputs. They're going to come up with the same ideas about what to do. So when, you know, if an issue facing transformation is around uninspiring ambitions, well, maybe it's because they haven't seen the future of generative AI. They, and not because any of us have special, well, some of you may, I don't know, maybe, maybe you developed it for all I know. But generally speaking, I think you know what I'm trying to say is that those who get to study it more deeply earlier because of the nature of our, of our jobs will kind of deep reach different outputs than someone who actually doesn't even, reads it, doesn't even know what it means, right? So this is all about building the knowledge to succeed, giving them confidence and enthusiasm and, you know, belief that they can actually win. So instead of just saying, you know, instead of 16% of people believing that they're working for an organization that wins, which by the way means four out of five people are coming to work every day, believing that they're going to lose. Now, not to get all Ricky Bobby on everybody, but if you're not winning, you're losing right? I'm not super competitive that way, but in this case, that's the reality. So if you have people who don't believe that their company is, is prepared or is taking advantage and competing, you know, you're going to be at a significant disadvantage getting the organization to do what it needs to do. You want to apply that learning to your company's unique way of working. So you mentioned, you know, these playbooks, um, a couple of people I recognize on this call have been involved in the creation of things like this. It's an investment. You know, there's a Coca-Cola way of, my, of marketing, but that doesn't have to be just a big company phenomenon. Every company should have some point of view on how it takes its products to market and how it engages with um, you know, the people that are lining its pockets, whether they are customers or consumers, business to business or business to consumer, there is a way that works for your company. So as these transformative technologies emerge, show up in the company and become a part of the day-to-day -day activities, making sure that they are integrated appropriately into how you want marketing to ha uh, happen is, is critical. Um, which kind of leads to you know, the criticality of a robust internal communications program. It can't be the marketing guys talking to the marketing guys, can't be, you know, the, you know it, it needs to be everybody. I tend to, I mean, I, and I don't often find my clients willing to do this, I would take this down to every individual in the organization. A lot of times, you know, you know the, the line workers don't really need to know this, that, or the other. I happen to not believe that. My opinion is the more people are on board, regardless of their role, yeah, the more people that are on board and understand what's going on, the, the smaller that gap between those 
who believe that they are there to win and those who aren't so sure, the smaller that gap gets. And then the smaller the differences are by function and by title. Current number two is all about getting clear and consistent value from external partners. Um, you know, there's no way around it. This is not, you know, whether it's digital transformation, marketing transformation, um, and, and frankly, I would say, despite trends to bring more and more digital marketing work or marketing work in-house, it can't all be done in-house. There's always going to be a reliance on external resources. So to that end, you know, my second question when I surveyed folks, when thinking about digital transformation capabilities sourced externally, is your company receiving clear and consistent value from vendors and partners? 12% say always. You know, we can have a debate on whether that's a big number, a, a, a pie in the sky number, not realistic number, whatever, but it's a number. It actually reflects what's going on. What's interesting is that, you know, the finance people aren't so sure. Whereas the marketing folks really enthusiastic about the value that they're getting. Here again, and, and as our IT folks, given the nature of transformative technology, it's not surprising to see IT people kind of leaning in and saying, yeah, this is working. The issue is the gap. The fact that the overall organization, only about one in 10, think that clear and consistent value is being delivered, um, tells you a big story, right? Versus sometimes, which by the way, you know, who wants to have that conversation with the CFO? Because as you can tell, finance is even more skeptical than the organization overall. So as the person looking for budget, looking to be able to spend and invest, drive the company toward the future, your ability to know within your organization, whether everybody sees the value from external partners um, is going to be critical. So how you do that is complicated. I wish I could say it's super simple, but it's not. There are a bunch of fundamental decisions that need to be made. Um, the very first is, you know, a belief on you know, what kind of partner am I looking for? Am I looking for one partner that can kind of help be the accountable resource for all of this stuff? Or am I truly committed to getting the best in class resource for a particular task? Now, interestingly, um, this concept was something that I learned at Coca-Cola. I was involved in, in creating um, all of the agent, you know, one of a couple of people building out the agency management frameworks, the strategies that govern how Coke engaged with external agencies. At the time, Coca-Cola had a very clear point of view on engaging best in class. If you study the trades, many of you know that a few years ago, Coke changed 180 degrees, all WPP. We want one throat to choke, which, okay, that's a choice. And it was a choice that was made specifically. It wasn't random that it changed. I have an opinion. I don't think that was the right decision, but it was a decision and it governs everything downstream. So what do you do with that? You know, the reason we all know this, or again, this audience is pretty informed, you know, it, I, I, it's hard for a generalist to be the best at everything, right? It, it, you know, with all due respect to my friends and those who work at large agencies or in large consultancies with a broad range of capabilities, yeah, uh, but I, it's really hard to kind of believe that you're the best at everything that would be needed, especially in a larger, more complex marketing environment. Um, Oh, but by the same token, too many specialists are really hard to manage. You're a couple, you know, that IT you cut the baloney pretty thin in terms of kind of specific skill sets, um, interaction design specialists. You know, what that word means sounds like it's all the same, but we all know that it's not, right? It really covers a whole bunch of different skills and your ability to organize those. Um, is, is critical if you're going to get clear and consistent value and drive belief that you're getting clear and consistent value. So the, the way we organize this at, at Coke, um, pretty straightforward, right? There's, you know, everyone's pretty familiar with, you know, phased delivery, a discovery phase, strategy, development, implementation, maintenance, and optimization. You know, you'll have your own, but they're gonna be, you know, plus or minus one or two of those phases. 
And then this notion of a specialist. We know that people with expertise in SEO are different than people with expertise in you know, UI design are different from people uh, who do social media. What people, you know, what the skill set is and when to bring them in should be a discussion. Again, I've got a point of view on what works. You'll have your own, but kind of saying one agency brought in against all things may or may not be the best model. You may land it there after going through an exercise like this, um, but I would not go, it, it would not be my recommendation or my experience that you'll be successful if you assume that at the intersection of those columns and rows is all going to be one. That's the going in. You know, we want to find one throat. This is why one throat to choke doesn't work, right? Because they're not all good at the same parts of the process and they're not all good at every tactical thing you want to do. Clearly the powers that be of Coca-Cola have made a different choice and are either convinced that they have found one firm who can do everything um, or they're willing to say, yeah, we say best in class, but it's actually, you know, best in class to pretty close to best in class is, is sufficient. And frankly, that's a legitimate thing so long as everyone clears it, right? So taking the time to document who does what and when all right, organize and deploy resources for the job they are best for and when they are most needed. And then back to the earlier point, current one about internal capabilities to extract value, right? To people book, map them to the right people who know how to work with those agencies. Sending in someone who doesn't really know how to engage in the work necessary and have them be the decision maker, it, it sounds like, well, who would ever do that? Anybody who's ever worked in an agency, we all know it happens all the time. Like, what was this? How this person get in the room? They don't really understand how this stuff works. Um, again, another point of view that I I don't know where where current state of affairs is, um, but being very transparent, especially if you are a buyer of these services, um, being super clear what it's going to take to win. Right, many times pitches and RFPs and things like that are all about how high can you jump, right? Well, I can jump pretty darn high, got it. You win, here's what I really need to know. You gotta go fast. Well, if I knew it was about going fast, maybe I would have hired different, uh, different partners. Or if you are pitching business, um, you know, I use these ideas now that I'm kind of selling my services and time. You know, I try to apply this to myself. You know, what is it you really need? And if folks are vague and coy, I begin thinking my chances of success um, are, are pretty limited or very unclear. Detail scope, um, you know, what does it actually mean? If I say I am doing discovery, well, you can see here an example from way back in the day. Brian, I can't see you. He was involved in some of this work with us, um, you know, for social media, for mobile marketing, search engine very clear description of kind of what is expected. It is a mind numbingly detailed exercise, but for larger organizations and larger programs, super critical for smaller organizations, smaller things if you're driving transformation. And if you know there is uncertainty around delivering value consistently and clearly, this helps deconstruct where folks are falling off the rails. Why don't you believe? Well, you know, in this little bucket here, I, I don't see something happening. Okay, well, I can solve that. And then again, another pretty mature model, you know, the, a, a factory, Coca was called a content factory. Now, how do we get ideas from beginning to end? Um, the same principles apply for um, any transformation effort. Simple stages and gates, you don't just barrel through. It's not waterfall necessarily, right? It can still be iterative. It can be you know, all that, you know, it can be, um, you know, di different development methodologies, uh, but clear decision-making is the key. Who is playing what role? So if you're not familiar with Rapid, that's a Bain model, um, it's good, right? It doesn't go in that sequence. You know, you don't recommend and then agree and then get input. It's not the sequence, but if you were to put it in the actual sequence, it doesn't make a clever little acronym. So, you know, first you got to, kind of get the input, then you make a recommendation, uh, then you get everybody to agree, then you decide, and finally, once a decision is made, you perform. Current three is about ROI. 
um, here too. Um, when thinking about current priorities and the business impact, how confident are you about the return on digital transformation in initiatives? If this is you, the reality is that it's 50-50. You know, some people say yes, yeah, some people say no. Um, on a $2.6 trillion bet, now that's nuts, right? This is exactly why you know, these initiatives fail because nobody is really sure about um, what the ROI is. Once again, this is intended to help you as, as transformation leaders, digital marketing transformation leaders, or just folks operating in political environments, which is not a dirty word in my book. That's the reality. And knowing that there are people around you who either um, are, are candid in their skepticism um, or passive in it, they create the rocks. Yeah, everything is good, but boy, I sure I wish I had that dollar in my organization instead of those marketing guys who are getting this money to go do this thing that I don't even know what it is. That's where the bad behaviors come from, right? And the intention of this tool and the way to use it and use these questions is to ferret out, you know, why people believe this. If you're not extremely confident, if you're only somewhat confident about the ROI, you're going to want to ask, well, why is that? well, this, that, and the other. And that feedback begins to help you if you're new in your role, stuck in your role, really begin to kind of dissect it. So we all know, you know, you know, for marketing transformation, you know, getting the basics done through, you know, well, yeah, we'd like to think it's straightforward. It's not, it's still pretty complicated, but at a basic level, yeah, everybody should be doing something related to tracking and analysis and whatnot. Um, it does get um, more complex, um, you know, if you get into the multi-touch attribution space, you know, the MMA has a great model to help everybody um, get into that world. It is wildly complicated, not for the faint of heart, and frankly, probably not worth the effort for most marketers. Now, if you're spending four, five, ten million dollars a year, and someone says, I want to know what every billboard is doing versus every magazine ad versus every social post versus every search result. Yeah, $10 million a year budget is going to cost you a million dollars to get that answer. Probably not worth it, right? Let's, be, let's have that discussion and maybe kind of right size what it is we're going to do. If you're talking about um, business transformation, now, here's a, what I think is a super helpful model. You see this built for Coca-Cola. You know, you've got the company who works with bottlers, who sells to customers, who sells to consumers. Um, two things. One, I use the same model at UPS. It's the thing that drove us to develop our, you know, our tracking tools that are, you know, look, I mean, 1996, we were using this model to figure out how the web was going to impact our business. It wasn't that fragmented, but that wasn't Coke's business, right? Um, I literally, you know, I had caught wind of a meeting. I had literally five minutes to influence that meeting. I, I, know, I know the answer to this. I learned that at UPS. This is what we got to figure out. What's interesting in this model is the introduction of the brand beyond the consumer, kind of reintroducing it, right? That's all the, um, that's all the influencer marketing stuff. There's a ton of marketing that that happens after the sale is made. So kind of getting all your models figured out around the sales and then kind of, yeah, I sold it, I'm done. We all know that that is an incomplete thing. What this diagram is trying to communicate is that we as marketers need to create content, right? To influence each one of these links and extract data from those transaction sets. What's going on between the, you know, the core company and your, you know, your manufacturing capability or distribution capability. That's one set of transactions. What is going on between those people and your retailers or resellers, so on and so forth. Here again, McKinsey has something they call the value model that helps business leaders kind of figure out where to start and what to work on. What is the low, per, what's the low hanging fruit? What is it we're actually doing? Because um, again, that's important because as you saw from the data, you know, most folks aren't really clear about the ROI. So if you can get that clarity about what you're actually doing, whether it's through things like Google Analytics, multi-touch attribution models or something in between, whatever's in vogue at the time, you'll want to do that. If you're talking about business transformation, 
drilling down into these you know specific things is critical, but no one would counsel you, including me, to get hyper focused on any one thing. You got to look at the totality of, of the opportunity. The fourth current is around innovation, right? And here again, um, I ask, you know, which of the following describes your, well, let me go back for one second, actually, and make a critical point. Innovation is not the same as transformation, and transformation is not innovation. You can transform using the same old stuff, but in different ways. And we'll kind of talk about that. And, and also, you can be pretty innovative, but never really transform your business, at least in a, a meaningful way. So while the ideas are linked, they are separate. And getting to that precision of language is, is pretty helpful, I think. So again, you know, I asked this question here. Um, yeah, we love new technology and among the first to experiment with and use them. 16% of all those people surveyed kind of believe that. But if you want to know where the gaps are, you know, the C-suite really optimistic, really bullish about, oh yeah, we are right at the top of all this stuff. We are, we are on it. We know what to do. But when you start clicking down into the organization, enormous gaps emerge, right? So if you've been that VP or director, manager, individual contributor, trying to get your company to embrace new technologies, I would suggest this is the discussion you want to have. The reason you face head, you know, headwinds or cross currents is because the, the, the team of people at the top of the company already think they're doing that. Which is, ah, okay, well, what exactly are you doing? And we start getting into that communication thing and nobody really knows what's going on or what do we even mean? about these terms. So you know, without drilling down into the rest of it, you can see where the gap would be. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple of ideas before I start to try to wrap it up and take some questions. If you haven't read it, if you're a person who likes to read these books, there is a phenomenal book by a fellow named Kumar Mehta, who wrote a book called The Innovation Biome. Um, and in it, you know, they are case studies of companies where innovation is part of the culture not a project team, but part of the culture, culture of yes, right? And he offers up a few really interesting examples. Um, and one is this notion, if you really want to drive transformative innovation, using those two different words purposefully, you know, it, it's not necessarily just one thing. It's the combination of maybe pre-existing things that can combine to create a huge difference in the overall experience. So everybody will talk, you know, we can talk about, you know, movable type as being this transformative thing that happened whenever it did, you know, the 1500s, 1400s, but the component pieces have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, right? Movable type was invented by the Chinese, right? The notion of a press has been around forever, we're making wine. The combination of those two things created an experience for the world of, cap, you know, of, of, of inscribing books, of writing things down, be it a Bible, be it whatever, um, be experience delta. Yeah, you, the movable type didn't have a press. Chinese had the idea, but they hadn't combined those two things to create one new thing, which is what um, Gutenberg actually did. One of my favorite all-time examples is getting your head around the right question. This is this question in you know, a book called Hitting the Brakes. It's a, actually a philosophical book. Um, sounds like I read. I've, I've shared the three books that I've read in the last 10 years. Um, ask this question, whose job is it to keep skidding cars from killing people? Well, that's a really powerful question because the answer isn't obvious, right? The answer, you might say, well, it's the tire manufacturer or the brake manufacturer. Or, you know, maybe it's a road paver or heaven forbid, you know, actually the driver has some responsibility here. Um, the truth of the matter is everybody kind of has a piece of the puzzle, right? And to the point about an experience delta, the origin technology for anti-lock braking systems, which were ultimately developed through a collaborative process facilitated by the British government came from aircraft carriers. 
Now, who would think the same technology or the inspiration to stop a car is going to come from the same technology to stop a plane from landing on a boat? But it does. And people knew this, but what they didn't have was the ability to share information, which is why something at this level, right, requires government intervention. We can all have a political discussion about big government. It's not what this is about, right? There are certain cases where moving information around is critical. I know from experience, back to that sort of, you know, in, you know big company experience, Turning battleships, it's about kissing babies and shaking hands. You got to get out there and talk to people because everybody has a piece of the answer to the problem you are trying to solve to transform the company. And as a case study, right, anti-lock braking systems are great. You know, open to new ideas. We all know this. Most folks know, you know, look, microwaves actually come from the development of, you know, you know, enemy aircraft, World War II, trying to figure out a way. The guy in the lab trying to build a better radar detection system happened to have a chocolate bar in his pocket. It melted. Huh. Why was that? Microwaves. Okay. The first one, 750 pounds. Today you can walk, you know, into Target and grab one for 70 bucks. So you got to be open to kind of what's going on. Everyone's favorite example of companies that missed the innovation, Kodak. Um, you have to be accepting. Those are two. Um, critical keys that need to be turned. Open is not enough. You also have to, you know, Kodak has the patents on digital photography. They just weren't accepting of its implications. So they didn't do anything. So to kind of sum it up, you know, it, it, you know, you got to know the gaps. First of all, you got to know the gaps. You got to go find out what's really going on below the surface. And I'm giving you some data um, from my experience. I, I use this in consulting engagements and it gets more budget. Right, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you that again. Happy to share more. Um, you know, capabilities are key. Building brains, communication, understanding value creation are the three things you want to do to you know close gaps in that area of people on the payroll. Um, you know, if it's about getting value from external partners, fast decision making, rigorous and disciplined selection of partners, accountability and clarity into what you really need is gonna give you what is necessary to help um, get those who are either unaware of what you're doing, right? They're, they're, they're not against your agenda. They just don't know about it, right? Call them the, you know, just the unaware or the skeptical, right? Or, or the downright opposed, right? Because those people exist in every organization and being clear with this stuff, when you're spending money on folks they don't know, it's gonna be helpful. When it comes to the ROI, um, uh, you know, right size those expectations and being clear about value creation is important. A very quick story. Um, I've done a lot of research with uh, the IAB and, and the MMA, you know, figuring out the role of, you know, things that we all take for granted. But there was a point in time, if we go back, you know, when we weren't clear if banners actually sold stuff. That research needed to be done. I was a part of those studies when I was at ING. Um, similarly with mobile, One, you know, we all have phones, but we didn't know what role it played. Um, turns out that it does. I did that research and brought it back to my colleagues at Coke, because um, in, in an ROI context, we need to spend more on mobile because we can sell more Cokes. Everybody said, that's amazing. That's great research. I don't doubt it. I don't disbelieve. I don't have any questions. Um, well, that's awesome. Well, guess what? Nothing happened. Nobody changed. So, which led to the next question, why don't people do what's good for them? Why don't companies do what's good for them? And it turned, that was the question that led to that HBR article at the beginning. It was that question that I asked of the MMA, who then went and did the research that resulted in an HBR article that, well, value creation comes in different forms and not everybody cares about it the same way. When I walked into a room of global brand managers and talked to them about, exchanges, right? Performance marketing. We can sell more Cokes. Global brand managers at Coke don't care about that. That's not their job. Their job is to drive engagement. They want people to stay in love with Coke and maybe build out experiences. Cokes with no sugar, Cokes with no caffeine, Cokes that come out of a freestyle machine, right? Those are experiential things that they do care about. So I walked into that meeting completely ignorant of the fact that, you know, they may 
not be interested in exchanges as a form of value creation. All right, well, I had to change my models and I had to go do something different. Now we had a great, anyway, so you get my point. That is super critical. Current three and current one are inextricably linked and then get, you know, figure out how to get rid of friction, wherever it is, whatever is slowing you down, whether it's from a marketing point of view or a business transformation, find that friction and get rid of it. You know, in innovation, just know your North Star. You know, I, you know, I, to this day, you know, I, I hear, oh yeah, you phone in one hand and Coke in another. That was my North Star from the role of mobile marketing at the Coca Cola at the Coca Cola company as marketers. You know, as, as employees of the Coca Cola company, we had all heard about you know putting Cokes within arm's reach of desire. Even if you didn't work for Coke, you knew that, right? Or you you may have read that. Um, using an enabler, you know, mobile at the end of that arm between it and desire, right? Is it an enabler or a barrier? The North Star was to make mobile an enabler of desire. Step outside of your routines, talk to your colleagues, customers, consumers, and don't get stuck. If you're stuck, you got to find a way out. I know folks who do that. You know folks who do that. You know, they are meeting techniques, facilitation techniques, brainstorming techniques, um, but, you know, getting the right question, right? What, what is it we're trying to do is, is super, super important. So with that, let's see, there's a few minutes left. Um, if you want to scan that, if you want this presentation, um, scan that code, it'll fire off uh, your email client uh, with my email address and I'll, it'll come into my inbox and I'll, I'll send it out to you. Um, of course, you know, um, I think David is recording this, so I don't know where it's going to go. I assume on the Slack channel, um, but you'll be able to get it that way. And this is also how I'm going to make good on my my promise to, to get those of you um, who hung out here to the end, um, your, your Uber Eats um, gift card. So with that, I am going to hush up. I see a couple of questions. Uh, bump, 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 bump. Good, good, good innovation book. There it is. Any questions or David, I don't know how you want to wrap this up. I went it, super it, fast. It, it, yeah, well, well, we've got a few minutes. So open to any and all uh, questions coming through here. Um, it, yeah, who's, uh, I, I, I mean, this, this, this is incredible. Like, I love this like um, master of class that we got to uh, dive into. So um, um, yeah, yeah, who's, uh, uh, and would have anything you want to follow up with Tom about live? You'll also, um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, hey, look, the, the reason I built this tool is so that folks like you who are in leadership positions, you know, you, you need a quick diagnostic tool, lightweight diagnostic tool that, you know, it, is not going to require, you know, six months and six figures to get some, you um, actionable information. I say that not to diminish the value of those six month and six figure engagements. Many of us are involved in those and they are helpful, but that's those things. That's the journey. That's what I'm saying. That's the journey. That's the one that takes time. What is um, most, what this tool is used for is to help um, folks who need to get going quickly. Maybe they're new to a job, have a new engagement, they're trying to have a quick impact. It would be this this technique would be useful for them. If you've been in your role for a little while and you're beginning to get nervous because it's been harder than you anticipated to change or the role that you have isn't quite what the recruiter or the hiring manager told you, you know, this technique can help surface those, you know, what I keep on calling the rocks and the cross currents so that you can take action you know, it's an academic exercise in part, but I've also used it with client engagements. Um, and the feedback, you know, ranges from, yep, this validated what we're doing, but it was good to have the data to without this, I wouldn't have gotten the increased budget that I needed. So I know, um, and I know that it can be helpful for others. And I know that I've used it, you know, in my career in one way, shape or form or another. So anything I can do to share and help y'all be more successful. I'm, I'm happy to do. Well, appreciate that, Tom. We appreciate you. And uh, yeah, and no, uh, this, uh, 
um, very useful for a lot of folks in the room and and yeah happy to share this back in slack as well and just uh make sure everyone get it uh can't encourage you enough to go scan the code reach out to tom he'll give you a little lunch bonus in the process uh, never hurts um and uh great to just great you, to to learn you, from great you. you should have dialed in sooner there are a lot of hat tips to the great work the mma is doing so thank you for being <laughs> here i'll get you a copy all right, All right. Well, thanks, David. Thank you for yeah. the forum. Everyone, thanks for joining in. We're right at time. We're going to give back just a couple of minutes. Um, I, I truly do hope it was helpful. Um, and um, anything I can do to help you guys be more successful or take a little friction out of your life or avoid those rocks, let me know. And I'm, I'm here to help you.